Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the British Academy and to the November lecture of the British Institute for the Study of Iraq. Uh, my name is Paul Collins. I'm the current chair of council of the Institute, and it's wonderful to see so many of you here this evening for what promises to be a real treat, I think, uh, uh, an exploration of art, archaeology, heritage, and uh, its relationship with people. Normally at this point it would be my duty to introduce uh, this evening's speaker, but um, it is a special event and I'm thrilled to be able to introduce, uh, to introduce the speaker, uh, someone um, who has uh, extraordinary experience in his own right as a, uh, as a cultural specialist and an expert in modern and contemporary Iraqi art, uh, Ahmad Naji. And so, um, please, I'd like to invite uh, Ahmed to the podium to invite the speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Collins and the British Institute for the Study of Iraq and the British Academy for the invitation and hosting us. Um, I wish to, as Dr. Collins uh, mentioned, I wish to introduce Rashad and his project um, and try to give you a context and a definition of Safina projects. Because during the early uh, conversations that Rashad and Hannah uh, and I, we had a few years ago, uh, in my own mind, I was uh, sort of trying to find a definition, trying to find a category to place uh, Safina projects in. Then I resorted to <coughs> what is termed as definition by exclusion or a diagnosis by exclusion. And um, Safina project, it is not an expedition. It is not a contemporary art project, per se. It's not um, an adventure, nor an academic study. Um, in my own mind, it is a new category of a form of a societal, environmental, cultural, artistic rescue mission. This is what Safina Projects is. So, like, is it, is it like a biblical rescue mission, like Noah and his ark rescuing people from the flood? Rashad is rescuing people with a reimagined ark, but from a drought opposed to a flood, and uh, rescuing things from elimination. The current understanding of concepts in Iraq, as we understand it, is more or less based on the modern uh, Iraqi state, the, the state that was created in 1921 with the help of Gertrude Bell um, and other people that shaped the culture and the definitions in Iraq, whether we like it or not, um, Saad al-Hasari, King Faisal I. And in a way, this sort of identity and, and modernism and understanding starts from Baghdad itself, which is an Abbasi city. At the same time, it was a medieval Ottoman city that is emerging to become a modern city. In the heart of the city lies the river, which everyone was sort of forgetting. But the river actually is what provides you the face of the city, the, the culture that is uh, the, the, the providing the main current um, of the artistic and cultural forces uh, that, that, that's pushing it. So, to give you um, a parallel, let's say, reading of history, we, re we look at art history. And when looking at the um, art groups formed mainly in 19 1941, the two people in the picture we see there is Rashad's grandfather, Hamad Salim, <coughs> and Rashad's uncle, uh, Suad Salim. And the man in the middle, obviously, is uh, uh, Abdul Qadir Rassam. And then the first group of the pioneers, pioneer Iraqi artists, that's uh, Jawad Salim, half of the Durubi, um, uh, Atta Sabri, and Akram Shukri. And you can see from the beginning that these kind of uh, these uh, artists, they were inspired by nature rather than any sort of um, you know, a political trend or a sort of propaganda art. And one of the important documents that we have is the art of Abdul Qadir Rassam which documented several aspects of life, including, uh, you know, the kinds of boats and vessels um, in the um, uh, rivers. Then the young 
a group of artists who were sent abroad to study uh, modern art from France and Rome, etc. Um, while they were mesmerized and impressed by what the museums in the West were offering, they went back to Iraq and they had their chance to be part of the new establishment of museums. So they were, they were artists, but they were very much in direct contact with archaeology and Islamic history. And this has shaped and informed the way that they interpret their identity. In 1951, 10 years from the group that was formed, we have the first, well, the second group, but it's the first group that actually had a manifesto in terms of how to interpret its identity based on using history. Um, and that's Joa Selim, Shakar Hassan Al Said, and the Baghdad Modern Art Group. And the formula was simple. We have Mesopotamian heritage and we have Islamic heritage. And we use this heritage, we interpret it through the prism of the moderns, through the, through the prism of Picasso, Matisse, etc. And we would, Joa Selim's sort of proposal was something like this. You would, um, Islamic history through the prism of Picasso, sketch, you would end up with a painting like this. And this was known as the Baghdadiyat style. And from here, early on, you can see there are several elements that will uh, permeate all the way through Iraqi art. And that's the crescent shape and the different motifs that we're going to see that all relate. In terms of sculpture, obviously, Assyrian uh, wall reliefs were a great inspiration for Joa Selim, especially with the different artworks uh, that he was commissioned um, to do. And one theme that was very important to him is the people rather than uh, just the nature or the objects that we have or the buildings and monuments. So this uh, painting, we don't know where it is, but in the same year, this magnificent uh, uh, bronze relief was uh, um, done. And what we can see here is the buffalo bull uh, constructed or deconstructed as a crescent, the woman here in different uh, uh, art forms, uh, very much uh, symmetrical to the way the motif is uh, done, different crescents and different triangles and different motifs. And if you look at these in the eye of your mind, you can almost reconstruct them from images from the marshes that we have nowadays. So what Jawad was doing is looking at the living heritage and making icons from it. Jawad, 1961, 10 years, so 1941, 1951, 1961, 10 years after Jawad passes away, leaving us with the Freedom Monument. And the Freedom Monument is considered as the sort of the culmination of the modern period in, in Iraqi art. But Iraqi artists continue to inspire themselves from the, the you know, localities, environment, etc. And they continue to look at people, look at costumes, look at colors, the way they interpret their art and reinvent themselves. So in the previous one, we have Fayyad Hassan, and then we have half of Durubi. Each artist has his own style, but still the elements are the same, the geometric forms, the uh, uh, plant types, um, uh, the different objects, and then uh, Ismail al this is a later period, so now we're looking into 60s and 70s, and you can see still the concentration on the family unit and uh, the different crescent shapes um, and uh, the, the earthing colors. Then one of the artists who makes a breakthrough was Shakir Hassan al Said, in terms of looking actually at the craft looking at the heritage that's produced by the people who live in these conditions that we're trying to portray as, as a source of a, a primitive uh, indigenous art um, that has uh, different pure forms. So in the background is one of the rugs that was made in uh, famous Izar Samawa. This was from the Makia collection, which was collected in the 1950s. And then uh, Shakar Hassan deconstructs the face, inspired by uh, Picasso, the same uh, formula with the crescent. And then he creates a painting on that side, which is very much inspired from these rugs. So the rugs provided, um, uh, you know, it's like an untapped source of inspiration in color and forms. And the Izar Samoa itself, which we see here on this side, with the different patterns and motifs, is very much replicating different things that they have in the natural environment around them. 
but they add their different uh, flavors and, and colors and interpretation uh, to it. This is from the workshop that Rashad did of uh, Izar Simawa, uh, and these are still very much the traditional designs of the uh, Izar. And then 1991, and then 2003. Two dates, uh, we can say in a way interchangeable, in terms of the, the, um, the resources, the land, the people, everything is um, in a way endangered. Uh, the, the palm trees, uh, we know from the 1991 that were mostly destroyed during the uprising, cultural heritage, whether it's the Samarra or the, you know, uh, uh, the site of Babylon or different places, they were all um, uh, victims of the 1991 and 2003 and the different cycles of uh, um, sectarian violence. So where does this leave us? How can we, um, in a way, rescue the source of the inspiration? Because we have archaeological, uh, let's say, finds, and we have uh, um, tangible heritage in terms of what's pre preserved in a museum. But what happens to the intangible heritage? The heritage... Uh, that is um, transferred from generations, from grandfather to the grandson, uh, the stuff that we don't have in museums. We have two museums in Iraq, or one museum in Iraq, Mat'haf al Turat al Shabi. But the only two publications we know from that uh, exhibition were in 1967, um, and there is nothing else. And we don't even know how good is that museum at the moment, or if there has been any sort of. Um, uh, sponsorship uh, to it. So this is where Safina Project comes. Comes into rescuing the heritage from the main, from from its main source, and transferring the knowledge, and in creating a sort of environmental awareness. It is a, it's like it's a multifactorial process. It's very difficult for me to sum up in one word, but I thought going back to biology, maybe I can sum it up this way. So in every cell, we have a DNA. And the DNA is the code, that, which is intangible, that's going to be processed into a protein, which is tangible, that will create the molecules, that will create the organs and create the body. What Safina Project is doing, it is somewhere here, between taking the intangible and making it into tangible. So with this, I will leave you now to Rashad Sini. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Colin, Dr. Colin and uh, Ahmed, for a, a really great introduction that uh, does help. There we go. We are Safina Projects now, and uh, we started, I started individually as, as an artist working to uh, reclaim, like uh, Ahmed said, uh, a, a heritage that is totally threatened now, like not disappeared. Uh, to get to where we are as men, oh no, oh no, that's the one, wrong one. Has meant that uh, we've had a lot of help, a lot of help to do it, and uh, it's become quite a complex project now. And many, many different players working into it. Uh, so, what, I'm, what I'll be speaking about is how we get to where we are now, which is, you know, has all these very many people, many groups, many individuals that have, have seen the promise of the project and have now collaborated with us, have helped us on the way. There are many individuals as well that have helped me to get to where we are. So I really a big thank you to everybody that has, has done so much to see this uh, very strange and maybe unusual uh, mission to what is looking like the beginnings of fruition. But to start the thing, I'd have to go back to Sweden in, in, in the 60s. And the man over there is... Tor Heyerdahl. I don't know how many people, well, from the age, maybe most people over here know. Who knows Tor Heyerdahl? Yeah? Who doesn't know Tor Heyerdahl? 
Well, it's the young people. And the thing about it is that okay, that's Tor. And he had, in the, in the 60s, for 20 years, he's been quite famous for having done uh, an exhibition called the Contiki in 1947. But over here, as well as is my dad, who was uh, Nizar Salim at the time, um, uh, in the embassy in, in Stockholm. We had opened the embassy in Stockholm. An artist, but not only an artist, uh, a writer, uh, a humanist, an internationalist. And I think it's because of this internationalism that he represented that uh, um, I have maybe have a little bit of window to gather information, to do things, and also to get to know Tor Heyerdahl, because very few people outside knew Tor Heyerdahl. Uh, this over here, at the time uh, in, in Sweden, everybody was mad about rafts and boats. And this whole project, by the way, is about ancient boats, and very, very ancient boats. So the, the picture over here is of a raft that my father did in Stockholm, uh, basically to party. And the other one over there is uh, the Contiki. Now, the Contiki was, was an expedition in 1947. Uh, right after the war, and that's really important, after the war, after the conflicts and, and the problems that we had, there was a reaffirmation of, of humanity and this group of young people going together and crossing over the ocean. Well, what Tor had done by building this, uh, this uh, raft and starting from, from Chile crossing over to um, the Polynesian island was to try to prove that the seas were not barriers. Water wasn't a barrier. And you could, with the simplest of, of, of uh, uh, boats, actually cross oceans and uh, follow on the currents. Now, this type of, of boat is what we would call up, 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 that one. Uh -huh. uh, raft. Uh, basically, in Iraq, it's called a kelek, which is one of the simplest of, of rafts, basically uh, a, a platform with floats underneath. The Contiki was a, was a uh, log, log float because the balsa, balsa wood, which they used, was very light. But you have to remember that Iraq uh, is... Uh, boats for, in Iraq are probably as important as the plow or any other instrument in creating the civilization that we have seen growing there. We have the two rivers, the Tigris-Euphrates, and it is because of the Tigris-Euphrates, these highways and the movement of, of material and the fact that we're on the Gulf and have a, the sport, that you had this development of, of culture, as important as agriculture in a way. Yeah. So this uh, over here was a, uh, uh, a kelic that we built in, in, uh, uh, in Turkey. We'll come to that later. But you can see that Iraq had, you know, in, in southern Iraq, we don't have stone. But they used to bring stone and, you know, the sculptures like uh, Babylon, the, the line of Babylon, all these things were brought from the mountains. These came down on, on these skeletons. In the early 70s, late 90s, he also built uh, reed boats to further this idea of, 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 uh, of civilizations having been in contact with each other and having influenced each other. There are two main schools of thought, the diffusionists and, and the uh, isolationists, the idea that, uh, that civilization in isolation of each other and civilization developed with infected, influencing each other. Uh, so that was one of these things. And if you look at it, the first one failed, the Ra, the Ra one. Uh, it had been built by, by Ch Chadian uh, boat builders. Uh, they had forgotten one line. So the boat basically buckled on the way. And then they brought uh, the uh, Amara Indians from Lake Titicaca, which is the highest marshland in the world, and they built very sophisticated bundle boats, they used reed boats, and they succeeded in crossing over to Barbados from, uh, uh, from uh, Morocco, from Asfi. Uh, these boats, the Kelek, the reed raft, these are universal boat types, and all the boats that we're looking are universal boat types. You find them all over the world. As far as I'm concerned, this is, these represent sort of a universal language of making. Yeah. Over here you see boats, for example, this is from Hawaz, from the marshes. Yeah. We have very early depictions of them. These are made, and very importantly for me, this one's made with uh, palm, uh, with banana, with any kind of material that's gathered together 
and made into a bundle. So in 1976, Tor came and started to investigate the making of a, of a boat uh, with marsh Arabs using the bundle techniques of, uh, that are used in the Malise, very famous Malise. I'm sure all of you have seen it. There are some pictures of it over there. Oops. Uh, yeah, and he also found that there were certain times where you could uh, harvest the berdi. And over here, what, what really is interesting for me is that this, this man was engaged always with the people, with the makers, on field trips, engaged in learning from them in all of his, his different uh, trips you know, and different expeditions and, and stuff. And the idea of it was to build a raft a boat that could actually sail and decide its direction, a direction of boat. All the other previous expeditions that he had done were boats that were put into currents in the sea and reached their destination without really any need for further direction or propulsion. It was literally like rivers in the sea that they follow. But here, what Tor wanted to do was to, to establish a connection between the three main uh, centers of civilization, which is... Mesopotamia, the Indus, and the Nile. We managed later on to do this trip. And over here, um, you know, yeah, so we know that the Sumerians and the pre-Sumerians had boats, and they, they did travel. One of the, the reasons for that is that you know, Iraq doesn't have any metals, and we had the growth of, of the, uh, uh, the Bronze Age, coming out. They had to bring their metal from somewhere. We know that they brought them now from Oman, and we no, don't know how. We have very few evidence of what these boats like. This is actually over here the, uh, the entrance to what used to be a mine of copper, a whole mountain of copper. All that's left of it is that entrance. Over here, there's a, in, this is in the Green Mountains in, in Oman, a, uh, uh, a ziggurat, and uh, that's from the trip to uh, uh, Manyadaro, where we have also seals, Mesopotamian seals that we found there in, in, in the... Uh, and over here, that's Jeffrey Bibby and, and Dillman. Dillman used to be the, a holy city, a holy, holy island, sorry, for the Sumerians. There's those connections over there. Uh, including, uh, over here, you have the, the island of Socotra, of, of Yemen, where there's a cave filled with the graffiti of seafarers, including Sumerian seafarers, inside this cave. It goes right down. So these are trips. But for me, what, is, what I'll be doing now, and I think it's something quite difficult, and something that I've learned during this period, is actually to look at Taurus uh, and our, our Tigris uh, uh, reed boat in a more critical fashion. This is something new I've not done before in public, but we were wanting to prove that this boat was uh, a trading ship, a trading boat that would have carried cargo. I've come to the conclusion that it wasn't. So we'll try to see about that, because one of the things that we're looking at within this project is to actually discover what that trading boat was and uh, to learn from it. There's no doubt that Tor was amazingly influential. Yeah. And what he did was to liberate the mind, intelligence, and also the knowledge and the attempt to understand this prehistoric era where we have very, very little evidence for. Uh, here we have the building of the Tigris uh, reed boat. And you can see the bundles. They're basically bundles. Uh, uh, 22 on either side and the Khorasan in the middle over here and these two bundles are then with rope tied around the central bundle and gathered together into one big bundle that floats and everything is built upon it critically yeah. uh, that is a lot of weight that it itself is carrying it is its own Wait. That's a very important point for me. Yeah. Uh, what was a lesson learned from it was the fact that you know, he had brought Amara Indians 
from Lake Titicaca, the highest marshland in the world. It took him two weeks to bring them down to, to uh, 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 ground level, two weeks to acclimatize, and then brought them over. And we had a chain of, of translation where you had from Armara to Spanish to English to Arabic and then vice versa. Yeah? So we had this whole chain of, of thing going on. And then suddenly we noticed that we didn't need any translation. These Amara Indians and Marsh Arabs perfectly understood each other. They didn't have, and they built the boat together. You had this, the, the technique of the, Mar, of the Amara Indians with the quality of the building of the Iraqi Marsh Arabs. Yeah? And they built this amazing boat. None of his boats and none of the, any boats that have been made, this type of boat, equals the Tigris in its construction. Yeah? And it is this, this, this common language of making that uh, in, is, is, is key to the whole project that I'm doing. The idea that there is a universal language of making. It's not a, it's not a language of, of, that has been in, invented. You know, nobody invented the rope. The rope is there in nature. It's there in things. It's part of that universal language. Yeah. So rope is the other thing that, that I find problematic about the tigress because if you make rope, it's a heck of a job, Yanni, to, to make that rope. And the tigress used an enormous amount of rope, an enormous amount of rope. This rope was all... Uh, uh, yeah, the rope that we used was actually a rope that was uh, industrial rope. Yeah. So, I mean, to, to make... All that rope for that, you know, I found, I'm finding now problematic having made rope yeah, and having worked it. Yeah. November, we went down, we, we put it into, it's a beautiful boat. It's just, there's something just so, so gorgeous about it. Yeah. And um, put it into the water, and of course, that's the other thing, and it's really heavy, so getting into that water was, was, a, was a trip in itself. Uh, but the other thing over here that I have later, and this is one of the learning processes that I'm going through, is that I'm now re- realizing many things that I've experienced before through this project that I'm doing, yeah, is that the jetty, this island over here, this island over here, yeah, that connects the wharf or the jetty that's between the boat and the land, was, uh, is now key to me. It is the first boat. The first boats, the first objects that float are the nest. You know? Nests are, are things that are brought together and, and knitted together. And in a flood, they would float. You know? People talk about the first boats being the log boat. It's really just a mass of, of organic material. And in fact, the Marsh Arabs have terminologies for different types of these platforms, these organic platforms. You've got... You know, the, the Chubasha, which Chubaish is called after, which is a, fl- a floating island. You know, the Dibin, which is connected to the land. Yeah. And the Tehle, which is all the, the, the flotsam, the bits and pieces, animal uh, and uh, organic, that then knit together on top. And when you had the floods in Iraq, when you had the floods, this would all, some of it, would float. And you have people, you know, records of, of whole villages floating away in the floods. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing about, about, about Torres is, is his internationalism and his, his belief in, in humanity. It comes through in all his, his work of, of bringing together people from different, from different backgrounds and giving that opportunity. I was 20 at the time, which was amazing. It was like you know, being on a floating university with people that had... Amazing uh, uh, experiences. Uh, um, yeah, I'm, 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 the, I'm the little guy here. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so going down the, the, the river, there's been a debate in, in the academic circles that are interested in ancient boats, whether these boats were river boats, only river boats, sea boats, not sea boats, different people having different things. Uh, I found, or we found actually, that because of the weight of the boat, it has a lot of drag. It has drag. You know, and we were kept on being dragged to the, to the banks. You know? we were kept on being dragged to the banks. So whether this boat was a river boat at this size, I, have, I now have uh, uh, increasing doubt. But of course, it was 
a very beautiful time there. We were going through, through Basra over here, uh, and we did try to row. Oops. We did try to row the boat uh, over here, which was completely nuts. Because you, know, <laughs> you have 80 tons, 80 tons, and, and we're rowing, and literally all we produced were little lakes of, of sweat underneath and moving, hardly moving. So we have pictures of the ancient boats, all of them with rows. So, so again, is this a trading boat? I, I have my, my, my doubts. Yeah? But Basra at the time was, was a hub, and you know, Iraq was an amazing hub. And coming out into the sea, the thing is that these boats worked. They did work. It did work. We did end up traveling, and it was beautiful. And the idea, the, the thing about these, the, the Tigris was that it was like being on, the, on, on a body, on a living body. Because it's, it's organic, you could actually feel the waves passing underneath. You, know? you had that sort of, uh, that, it was totally, uh, totally really beautiful. And we learned to, to man it. We learned to, uh, to move it. But basically at the speed of a gentle bicycle ride. Yeah. All the way through. Yeah. And the other thing that, that, that captured my imagination was, you know, for, for a month and a half, we had no fish at all. Nothing. We, could, we threw every kind of hook, nothing. But then suddenly, fish were like popping on board, literally. You know, we had like 300 uh, of these amazing dorados uh, and, and 17 sharks. And it was like totally living. And once we went into the water and discovered, we found that because it's organic, and there's something that I didn't say talk about earlier, because it's organic, we had, it was not tarred. The boat wasn't tarred. It had built a garden over this period, and you had a whole life cycle around the tigress, complete life cycle, from the smallest, smallest, and, and, and worms, etc., to, to sharks. Yeah. And that was a, a, a you know, in itself, uh, a beauty. Yeah. But it didn't uh, last long. And uh, once we got to the Horn of Africa, we, had, we did, like I showed in that map, we did go to Oman you know, and then to, to the Indus and then cross to, uh, um, to Africa. I mean, the, 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 the presentation isn't about the Tigris, but the Tigris is, is a major part of, of you know, what, what has got me to where I am when it comes to this project. Uh, and we, we were forced to, to burn the boat because of the wars in the area. And that was, for me, quite a prophetic thing. It was like the saddest possible thing because we, we did have, uh, over here is an image of the side of, of, of the boat. We, had, we still had at least another, this is five months at and sea, after five months at sea. Yeah. We still had at least the same amount of time in the life of the boat. And it would never really sink completely. And we were, we were, we were like, properly, nothing had bent, nothing had just, I mean, we, were, we could have gone on and on for at least another six months. But because of the wars and, and in that area, Tor wrote a, a letter uh, to, uh, at the time it was Kurt Waldheim in, in the United Nations, and we were flying, we were traveling with a UN flag, you know, uh, denouncing the, the sale of, of arms and the, the militarization of that area. But what we see over here is, is you know, tourist, tourist uh, reed boat has become quite popular, and you've got all over the world quite a few examples. Many people have, have recreated these boats uh, and are doing all sorts of different variations of these boats. None of them has succeeded as much as the Tigris. And uh, still, I mean, and as boats that may have been built to this size to reach, uh, uh, you know, to reach somewhere... Possibly. As training boats, I, I, I wouldn't, uh, uh, you know, I don't, I don't uh, uh, think so. Yeah. Um, so the, the, and, and now what we find as well is that these reed boats have become accepted as the Sumerian reed boats. You find them in popular culture, you find them in anywhere we have images of a harbor in, in, in Sumeria, you have reed boats. Though all the evidence show that... Uh, they were actually what we call displacement boats, a boat that displaces the water and, that, and therefore has a hold that it can carry things in. Yeah. 
there have been now ex uh, trials or experiments to recreate this trading boat. This is the Megan that was uh, built and, and sailed in 2005. It, it sank as soon as it went out. You know, we have, we have the, the evidence, and we found the evidence in Oman of uh, 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 tar, asphalt, asphalt that had on one side the imprint of reed mats, and on this other side, barnacles. And this is another, another sort of reason why Taurus Tigris may not have been a trading boat, because the Sumerian boats are, are described as the black boats of Sumer, because they're all tarred. And so that is a, a, a really key point. Other than the rivers, Iraq has actually always been a, a, a petrochemical culture. I mean, we, we've used bitumen, tar, in all sorts of, of different things. It's part of, of the, the, the culture of the country from earliest times. Yeah? And we tried to do that with the, with the tour. We did experiments. Uh, there's a picture earlier I didn't show um, where we had bundles, one of which we had covered in, in tar and the other not. And that was covered in tar, uh, rotted. Because what you have is, if you have a slight crack in it, you'll have anaerobic uh, uh, decomposition within that thing. So a whole bundle boat can't be tarred. It moves. It'll crack. What will call it? So there's an attempt over here to create a, a, a boat that has a hold. Uh, but again, there's something about this boat that I can see immediately is fails on certain levels, one of which is aesthetics. You know, there's an aesthetic to boats. It has to be beautiful. A boat has to be beautiful. You know, and there's a, there's a logic as well in that. Uh, this didn't work, and there are other, other reasons for that. So until now, we do not have a working Sumerian trade boat. And that's one of our ambitions as an Iraqi working in this to see how to design that boat. Basically, by going to the logic of the land itself, of the material that is around, and to the boats that existed there. But this is just one of the, one of the aims. Another very famous Mesopotamian boat is the Ark, you know, which everybody knows. I mean, other than the fact that you know, uh, we only know the Ark as, as you know, the, the, the biblical Ark, but there have been 350 Ark stories or flood stories globally. It's a global event. It's a climate event that happened somewhere between 24 and 8,000 B.C. And then another one around 5,000 B.C. We, we know that we've got, we've got the, the, uh, the, the topography of the, the Gulf shows that, that these rivers, the, the Tigris and the Euphrates, actually extended all the way to the gates of Hormoz at one point. So it would have been... It would have been that's my very lovely daughter. <laughs> uh, so it would have been. So it would have been the kind of environment, the kind of material, the kind of culture, the kind of crafts that existed in that area that would have created this ark. But what we have in the ark, the European ark, is basically a 17th century cog. Nothing to do with the technology, nothing to do with the environment of Mesopotamia. And I think Europe might be the only place that doesn't have a flood story originally. Possibly. Yeah. And you have hmm? a, a flood story, an original flood story. I mean, the Aborigines of Australia have an oral flood story. Everywhere. Everywhere except, uh, you know, except Europe. You know? Because Europe basically was under ice, I think, at the time, or whatever. Yeah? So you have, you have that, um, this issue, I mean, there, um, with that. So part of this is also, part of the whole project is also to create some kind of a dialogue, a conversation in how people are looking at each other, how civilizations are looking at each other. I want to see how a Mesopotamian ark would have been built. In 2000, and, uh, I think it was four... Uh, Professor Irving Finkel also discovered or, or translated a, a tablet, a cuneiform tablet that described the, uh, it was Babylonian, 1500 BC, that describes the ark as round, 
It's like a coracle, a round boat, you know, which they, they recreated in, in Corella, tried to recreate in Corella, and that also sank uh, immediately. You know? So, I mean, that's the one thing. So, um, it's interesting that this is 1,500 BC. Now, the first mention of the Ark is around 3,500 BC in the Gilgamesh, yeah? which describes Altana Pishtum and, and the famous phrase of, you know, oh, oh, read, read hut, read hut, read wall, turn yourself into a boat. You know, one of the gods was trying to help humanity escape, you know, the damnation that you know, the gods were sick and tired and fed up of human beings and the noise that they made. They wanted to get rid of everybody. And one of the gods told the, you know, said, you know, give that hint of turning that boat. And that's one of our, our uh, uh, clues to the use of this material. Reads as part of it. You know, we, we had, you know, Iraq has become not just a shadow of what, what it was. It's, 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 uh, the, it can be the shadow of a shadow. You know? We've lost water, we've lost culture, we've lost connection, and this is the important thing. We've lost that connection between uh, uh, civilization, between culture and environment, and the environment, you know. And it's, it's crafts that connect those. So after many years, and also we've got another big problem that a lot of people are outside of the country, so we've got this whole drain, people outside of the country, so, you know, so there isn't that, that, that continuity of within the country of developing. Uh, and you have, and I won't go too much into detail, that, you know, that core you know, marshland that, that we say is sort of the, the, the birthplace of the, of the civilization of Abraham, etc., has gone through many phases of loss, destruction, whether flood dam, after, and, and dams, etc., you know, so it's, it's, it's totally endangered. We've lost a lot of that. But in, that, in 2013, I had the opportunity of, of uh, joining an expedition from... Uh, I'll go back to that. You know, up there from Hassan Kef, which is an amazing place because it's a, it's a nexus. It's a, a meeting point of the Kurdish, the, the Turkic and the Arab civilization in Hassan Cave. They still speak in Arabic that is from Abbasid period you know, in this place. Now, this place has now been, is now being erased by the Eliso Dam, which is also stopping the waters of the Tigris and, and, ex and extending that, that destruction, that uh, environmental destruction. So we managed to, uh, with uh, uh, Nature Iraq, this is uh, uh, amazing, Azam Alwesh, uh, who, who has been leading the sort of the attempt at the time to the recovery of the marshes? Yeah. Uh, and you know, I had also suggested, I think with uh, Ahmed was was one of the intermediaries about this idea of making a flotilla of traditional boats and going down the river from there. Uh, so uh, Azam and, and the, they they made this. Uh, marsh boat. It's not actually a tarada. It's called a tarada, but it's not. It's a, it's a standard uh, uh, marsh canoe. And uh, I built, helped build this kerek and this gufwa. Now, that's a very, very... Because we, I had to build it online with somebody that didn't know how to build it. just knew how to, knew how to do baskets. I told them to go to uh, Hella to set it to Hindia because I, I had... Uh, some, some idea that there may be remains of these gufa makers in, in Sede Hindia, but they didn't go. Instead, they found me somebody who didn't know how to make it, and I had to do it online through an intermediary. So basically, what we got was a 40% gufa, but managed to... Uh, <laughs> that one over there, you know? So this is, this is me testing it out and going, oh, my God, because we have to go in white water, start with white water in the mountains, and then go down. Anyway, we managed to, to do that, uh, that first trip, and then to actually go down the river in stages uh, until we reached uh, the Chibayish. And there are many things. I mean, one of the problems with this whole presentation for me was there's just so much material that has been gathered as we're going along. How to, what to choose has been a nightmare. You know, so if please pardon my, my thing, but we're going to move on. Right? Because one of the things that I saw over there is that uh, a lot of these traditional boats 
are now metal. And I mean every, you know, the canoes are metal or fiberglass. The, 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 the gophers that we saw were metal. Yeah. We even found, or well, I found, uh, a canoe, a kayak, that I identify as a First World War relic, yeah. up by Coote. It's the same one. I've done it. You can, uh, it's the same one. So metal has taken over. Uh, and if it's cheaper, it's quicker, it's actually much more efficient. But that's another sort of step back from that origin. So um, the, the project isn't aiming to return these boats as they were and have them used. It's to study them yeah, and to see that relation with, with, with culture. And I tried the, 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 the Gouffre in the marshes. It's not a marsh boat. It's purely a river boat. Yeah. And on the, I made a side trip to Halle and actually found a fishing Gouffre. Yeah. And the last one, which was built in 2003, apparently, yeah. um, and I found the, the, the makers of this gufwa. But during that whole trip, going down the, the, uh, the Tigris in this gufwa, I'd thought a lot about the ark. I thought a lot about it from, from quite way back. And it struck me that the ark really should be, could be a gathering, a gathering of, of all these different boats with the core being... The guffa, because when you gather the guffa together, they create this pattern of six around one, which in Iraq is used as, an, as a talisman to protect children. And it's right throughout the whole country. And you find it as well in the, in the, in the, court, in the, the, the temple courtyard of Warqa, embedded as ceramic pieces, the same pattern. It is the pattern that you get in the growth of the palm fronds, you know, it's a pattern of, of, of uh, uh, you know, it's an Islamic pattern. It's, pa- it's a pattern of the molecular structure of carbon, of water. You know? it's, it's everywhere, honeycomb, it's there. And specifically, when you gather reeds together, you have this pattern. Yeah. So if you had Gufa, and all these boats that I'm talking about, all these boats that we're looking at are actually boats that we can say are prehistoric. The Gufa, it's prehistoric. You have, you have these Gufas all over the world. We found a 3,000-year-old uh, coracle in Norway, of all places. Yeah? They're all over the place. These are, these are standard types of boats that everybody does. The only difference is the difference of place. And I have to, over here, also mention Assam's a terrible picture, but Assam is Saeed, who, who, who was my mentor in, in the early 80s when I first came to England, and he he introduced me to a, a way of looking at Islamic patterns that depended on the maker. You know, the idea that it's not a matter of, of like uh, some people have done, of complex equations, etc. It's basically a, a point, you know, a line, you know, and the movement around that point. And with this farjal, with this sort of compass, you can create all the patterns. And the, the simplicity of his, of his vision and the depth of its, of its spiritual view, because you know, the, the, the Seba'iyun, this pattern in, in sacred geometry is also called the flower of life. Yeah. So I owe, I owe Assam a, a, a great debt. And it was my first works of art that actually uh, that went, started the project. I sold them, and with them I started the project. Uh, over here was, was um, uh, 360 paper boats that gathered together made a perfect sphere. Yeah. So that was sort of my, my artistic proof that I was on the right track. <laughs> yeah. But the other thing about it is that there, there are different reasons why this is, why a, 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 an arc of gathering makes sense. Yeah. For one thing is that you use whatever you have around you. You're not going to build something you've never built before. You're going to depend on what you know and are, 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 have, you know, and are confident of. Not some super thing that, you know, that hasn't been tried even. That's one. The other thing is that once, once the, 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 it's, it's over, with, the flood's down, what are you going to do? If you have your whole village with you, all you have to do is unpack, and you're there. Yeah? The other thing is that a, uh, an ark doesn't have to go anywhere. All you do is float up you know, and float down. So there are logical things why this could be. I'm not at all saying that this was the ark 
or, or this is the thing. But had there been an ark, this is possibly one of the ways it's done. And by the way, this can help us maybe gather what we're losing in Iraq yeah, as a means. So when looking at the design, and I, I have to thank uh, two young uh, uh, Iraqi architects for helping me visualize it. Uh, yeah, and yeah. So I mean, the, the 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 design of it at that time I had used over here. That's a reed boat. And at the time, I didn't think of the reed boat or, or doubt the reed boat as as that boat that would have been used. I'm now thinking differently. And with a malif, this martial art malif, but in the round as a superstructure. And the whole thing on, on, on chibashes on these platforms. So this is the ark. And the first thing to do was to see about making the gufwas, which are the core of it. And that is what, what I started. And we built these gufwas, first with the fishermen gufwas, you know, Fishermen gufas, and now we have, a, we have I've got 11 fishermen's gufas, and I've got uh, one two meter gufa, uh, and we are going for the three meter gufa. But these people have only made fishermen's gufa, so they don't have to make it three, but they say it's impossible, even though we have plenty of evidence of, of gufas going up to six meters. These gufa disappeared maybe in, in the, you know, the big ones, once cargo ships, uh, boats, or Neither ships nor boats. Lorries and trucks took over haulage. We used to have haulage of, of everything with these, as well as ferrying. You know? So we're well on the way there. But also I went to, to uh, uh, Tomor, which is a, an oasis close to Karbala. And one of the, the real, uh, it's a true oasis, another area that has been devastated uh, ecologically. They used to have huge pools of, 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 of water, fresh water. These are fossil water. They're all dead. Garbage dumps. Yeah? Uh, you know, factories washing gravel, sucking up water. Ridiculous sort of things that are happening in, in the place. But I found there the last people that actually make rope out of the fibers of the palm, out of the, 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 and the leaves of the palm. Yeah. And I decided to investigate every kind of different... All of these, these, like this, uh, these are amazing... Uh, um, uh, furniture that are also palm furniture. So I'm looking over here and trying to explore all the different technologies uh, and, and the things that were made from the, the you know, like a palm tree. Uh, this is this is karab over here. And that's karab, which is the stump of the palm front, which is now uh, just burnt or thrown away. But they used to make everything from from. Uh, 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 what do you call it? floats for children to learn uh, swimming to uh, to tikram, yani to uh, shoes, shoe soles. We could, if we could work it, we could maybe make, remake shoe soles because plastic is from shoe soles is one of the curses that we have yeah. environmentally. So I think that there is, there is within, within this within, you know, there's a possibility of working, of people working, if we can regain these, these technologies, regain these techniques, regain these materials. And throughout, I mean, there are hundreds of people that I've met and engaged and, and been. It's so difficult to, you know, within this, to actually acknowledge the, the beauty and, and you know, the, the pride that people have in it. But we, what I'm looking at as well is, is uh, I'm looking <coughs> also in, in, that, in the archaeological evidence for techniques, and here's one of them that, that I, I find fascinating, which is the, the, um, uh, the ring post, which used to be a, or it's, it's, no, it's considered a, a symbol of Inanna, a, a goddess of, of love and, and of war and of, of wisdom. And it's interesting that there's a transition with an early Sumerian from that to the, the ring post uh, of the patriarch. Guy, I don't remember his name. Enki, not Enki. Which one? Who is he? the the patriarch, the the god made god? Yeah? I'm totally into Inanna. Yeah? So, I think that this not it may not be just a symbol, but can also be a technique for a pre Bronze Age technology using bundles joining together. Because what you have, what you have over here is you have 
something that, uh, a bundle that turns around, gives you a hole that you can fit something with, and then bifurcates and goes down. This is, you know, you could have quite a lot of different structures. I'm looking for, for technology to build that arc with. Yeah? And indeed, I, I built these uh, um, boats, the bundle boats, and also exploring with uh, you know, the ropes, etc., and, and different things. So these have been workshops. <clears throat> the other interesting thing over here is that these bundles, we, we're using bundles now that are just keen and, and birdie. But if you go down to Arabia, you find that they use palm as well, with bundles in constructions. And you've got constructions, for example, of uh, the, the Hodage. You know? This is the... the the, it's the ship of the desert, but there's an actual ship on the camel's back that, you know, and that's, that's out of palm. There, there are palm, palm bundle boats in Kuwait, in Oman, in Bahrain, all right through. So there's another material that we're not using in Iraq anymore that was from that area, and that has now entered into, my, into my, the technology of what I'm doing. We speak about the marshes, 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 but you know, Iraq used to have the amazing palm groves with water canals, and there were water canals previously right throughout the whole the country. Yeah? And these water canals, that all disappeared, where boats used to go, and they tell me about, you know, they used to take these, these beautiful boats into the palm groves and literally bring the, the dates into the boat, to the market, straight, you know? Nobody is mentioning this environment. And now with, with uh, uh, the saltification, the loss of water, the water coming up from the Gulf, these are all dying, salt. Yeah. And it's part of where I go. The, this is Bedran, uh, uh, Medina, which is uh, a very ancient uh, city, very little explored. And it has, Bedran has a lot of these orchards. And I, I went there... For quite a few weeks, just exploring palm technology with with people that love the palm tree, so much that 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 was learned, and you can see you know, the, the 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 place has has is dying, and you find that right through the country, everywhere it's dying. You know, it's literally Iraq is dying. If we don't do something, it's dead, and you're going to have a major, major, major problem with a lot of the, of more immigrants, etc. You know, we got to save the place. You know, we got to do something about the place, as well as losing this connection with the very beginning of civilization. It's the cradle of civilization, they say, but it's becoming very quickly, you know, a coffin. You know, it's becoming the grave. You know, it's becoming the coffin of civilization now. This is exploring the making of, of uh, the hub of the ark. And um, what I'm doing over here is I'm using, this is in, 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 in Hela and this is in, in Umeshuech. Uh, I'm, I'm exploring the, the, the technology of, of making it using the palm as a, as a, a delal, as, a, as an armature. Yeah. To make the structure that you can then use the palm, uh, the, the, uh, the cane, to make bundles around. Now, this can also uh, uh, we can also get at technologies of building with this that we can use. With climate change, you're going to have the need for shade. You're going to have the need for 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 you know uh, building. You need you get people working. So we're looking at this also as as means of of discovering contemporary uses. And here we have the the. An amazing picture that I found in uh, in, a, in a book on, on old boats at the, at the beginning over here that shows a, 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 a canoe but built with bundles of cane, no wood in it, and it's braced with palm. At the time, that was like you know, wow, you know, this, and reading, you know, the various uh, uh, adventurers and, and travelers who went there, Hornell, Chesney, there are a number of them, Fields, that went. There, they describe a time at the beginning of the century where most of the boats were these boats that were made out of canoes that were made out of cane that the, the, the inhabitants used to make themselves and last a year, but they've disappeared completely. And now we know. I think we know why. But you can see that, that you know, this, this for me is one of the, the keys to finding that 
trade boat. And over here, I'm, I'm making models. And you can see that it's a generic type. This is, this is a tiny man, whether it's huge or smaller or tiny, the principle is the same. And we have also over here uh, you know, evidence of it being skin. So I'm looking at different kinds of barriers and, and, and mattings to skin this boat and then to see about uh, tarring it. So we're, we're well in, in the way. Another amazing boat that, that is uh, Mesopotamian that has disappeared, has disappeared maybe mid-century earlier. Um, one person said that he saw them in the 50s was the Asbir. Yes. The Asbir, which is uh, a boat particular to, to Anbar region to heat. Heat is, a region, is the source of uh, um, a tar. Yeah? And it has been a source. Even the tar that's found in those clots that were found in Oman and, and Kuwait have been identified as coming from heat. And in heat, what they used to do is make a sort of like a wattle and daub boat. This is wood and, and uh, a cane that's basically the same system that's used in wattle daub, you know, architecture. You make a structure, you make a lattice, and then you cover it in clay. Over here, what they used to do is they make this lattice and they cover it in tar, and then they fill it with tar and take it down all the way to Basra, selling the tar. They don't have to come back. Once they're at the end of the route, just like the Kelek, they break up the boat and sell that as well. Yeah. So they had these boats coming down. They used to make it in, in just a matter of days. So we're looking now to build this as one of the boats. We want to recreate all the different types of, of Mesopotamian key boats. And each one of them has keys to that Sumerian boat. There are many boats that, that we, are, we are interested in. This is, this is the Ashari Belen, which is famous in, in, in Basra. Again, these have disappeared. All these boats have disappeared. Yeah? They're nothing. And we don't have a single person at the moment, yeah? and I don't consider myself yet an expert, yeah? who is a maritime historian. None yeah, in Iraq. Yeah? We would have Basra yeah, is, has now a museum, a great uh, achievement, but really should have a maritime museum. Yeah. To celebrate this, this amazing, amazing uh, uh, heritage. So you have, you have these, and from, from pictures that we have, for example, this is Maqamat uh, al-Hariri. Uh, we, have, we have examples of Basid boats, and they say that these boats are the origins, and Basra itself was the origin for Venice and the gondola. Yeah. It's much older, yeah. and you know, it's the same, you know, you know it's the same sort of shape. So there are all these wonderful questions. Was it there? You know, could we recreate that? Amazing sort of adventures of, of discoveries that are yet to, to have. Yeah? Well, going back to art, yeah? Yeah, the, the Meshhuf, this is the, the Marsh Arab, uh, uh, the, the Marsh Arab or Marsh Dweller, because some of them may not be Arabs, yeah? but Marsh Dweller, yeah? uh, like the Mendai are very old. Yeah, and they were in, in, in the marshes. Yeah. Um, it's an icon of Iraq. There's a pride with it. You see it not only influencing the abstract, yeah, and you find it in George's work, etc., this curvature. And I found also that this curvature is not just a curvature of the boat. It's a, it's a curvature of the actual palm fronds. The way the palm fronds fall is that same parab. Uh, parabolic. Hmm. So there is this, this uh, uh, iconography. And we have you know, uh, meshhus from the most ancient times, from uh, uh, Sumerian, uh, from the, the masquerade of Ur. You know, we've got it in, in... But the difference over there is that you have the, the two ends are similar in length. So we're looking now in, in studying the different kinds of meshhus their history, and specifically, you know, uh, you know, this is going to be the first time that we actually categorize these measures and find out what their history is, with the last people alive who remember it, who have been building it, who have done something, have had some connection with it. For me, the first, the one that I loved most was this, which I thought was a tarada, it turns out to be called a chilieke, you know, which is a popular 
boat, small, seven meters, not, not bigger, seven meters, that sort of thing. Most elegant. So I studied that, and that was the first one that I built in, 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 in Hoer, which was a center of boat making in the marshes, traditionally. We went there, we found some people who could build it, and we built it. And that was beautiful, because what you had is an intergenerational conversation. You had the oldest people, some of them who had you know, met you know, Thesiger, who had met Gavin Young, who had been one of them who had actually helped in tarring, in tarring the Megan, the boat that was built in, in, in Oman. Yeah? So we had all these people and conversing, and you had from the youngest to the oldest uh, uh, an amazing sort of... Uh, 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 and we built it with one... Uh, with what they had designated as their artist who had never built a chileka before. But he had seen it, and had known it, and he'd, you know, he was considered as a uh, thing. And this allowed us to imagine the building of the sort of Rolls Royce of, of, of uh, um, Meshoufs, which is uh, the Tarada, the Sheikh's Tarada. And that has a history in itself of how it disappeared and came back, and etc. And, so, and, and we're going into this and Fessinger, Fessinger documented this boat, but he also documented the aesthetics, the beauty of this boat, which I found very uh, attaching, very moving. Um, and so we, 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 have, we have managed to... Yeah, and yeah, this is Fessinger speaking about the Parada, this iconic boat. And, and through building the boat, we're, there's a whole language that we're learning, you know, about different parts of that, that we are, we're documenting. And we had, uh, uh, we, we went to, with Pitts River, they've got 5,000 photographs of, of Thesigers. It was like, you know, gold mine, you know, wow, boom. And in this gold mine, there were detailed photographs of the Zaima, this, this boat that, uh, uh, you know, that I so uh, want to recreate, and I think it's the details of it, you know. As well as, um, you know, use it, we, and we are now using Thesigers photographs. And, uh, but of course, and we, 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 and, and we got the funds from Nehran, thank you Nehran, very much, you know, for building uh, these boats. But what this boat needs is a boatyard. And that's what we're doing as well. This is uh, using part CPF, part our own funding, part we're looking for more funds, but the idea has developed now to make a, an actual center, a boatyard, in Hoer the only traditional boatyard in Hoer, just like you have a traditional boatyard in Venice, you know, and to recreate the boats there. So we've been building a boatyard uh, with great, for so this man, Zahir, uh, Abu Sajjad, Asadi, who has kindly given us land. And he's seen from the first Chileka just how, how beautiful and how exciting and how interesting and how, how this, this project is. And he's donated land where we're building this boatyard. We now have also students from, from the uh, University of, of Basra, architectural students, fifth year, working with us to, to document everything. And we've started to build the, the, the taradas. We have now two taradas that we've built. Uh, but these are we decided to make them a bit smaller. The, uh, the, the, the uh, tarada that was given as a present to Thesiger was 36 feet. That's how many meters? That's over 11 meters. Yeah, that's huge. You know, and, and frankly, we want to bring them, some of them over here. So, you know, so we decided to do two that are 11, uh, sorry, nine and a half meters to start off with and to make them two types, because we want to see how to be able to take these and make them and continue making them. So we're looking as boats for the tourism, because you don't find these boats when you go to the marshes. The marshes, none of these boats, they don't exist anymore. To have them for tourism and also as sporting boats. Every country that I know that has traditional boats uses them in festivals, in sports. Why can't we develop these boats as sporting boats on the Tigris, on the Euphrates? Imagine in Baghdad being a Nawaz, you know, 
and watching a race of these beautiful, beautiful boats that can have that continuity and raise maybe some of the morale of the thing. So these are the, the process of building. Uh, I won't go too much in detail because I'm also, I think, getting a bit stretched with time. But it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful experience. Such that, you know, the, the person who made one, uh, one of the Taradis decided to make what he called a lemdeggum, the buttoned-up one, which is basically a little kayak that is a pleasure boat. It's sort of like the, the MG, you know, of, of the place. <laughs> He's got lots of very romantic stories involved with that. So he made this, this small one, and we want to make all the different types of it here. Yeah. Uh, this was just a couple of days ago. And uh, Jawad, who made us the, the Chileka, is one of the master the builders, started to make these models. Yeah? And I mean, you're welcome later. I was going to actually hand this to you, but never mind. Uh, there's a model over there. And to see how to make both a, a sort of a, a model of this boat that can be for tourism as an object and also as to study as a, as a museum quality uh, models. And now we have also um, uh, united as partners with uh, young people from over here from 12 governments, but the governance. And they are dedicated activists, environmentalists, and also interested in culture. So we've joined with them to, to try to make a network to uh, uh, discover what we can. And also, and this is the big plan, in, in spring to gather as many boats as we can and make a trip from uh, at least Hele, if not further upriver, maybe from Haditha, from Heat, wherever we can start safely and go all the way to Basra with these traditional boats, studying the landscape, studying the, 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 the culture, the changes, as well as having hopefully a good time with a lot of young people as well as you're all welcome, I think, I know he wants to come then, or maybe. <laughs> right. And eventually, to bring these boats to England. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we've got crew over here. So we want to bring those boats. And we're out and we're now building a, a proper 11-meter uh, uh, Thesiger Tarade as well. So we want to bring them to England and create what we call sort of Mesopotamia upon Thames. <laughs> With with these boats yeah, coming from Oxford and a trip from Oxford to, to the estuary, yeah. gate crash Henley, yeah. <laughs> and outfit the boat, outfit the boat with these beautiful uh, uh, marsh Arab wedding blankets whose motifs can be actually taken and seen to come all the way from pre-Sumerian obeyed culture which we are now working as well. We're working with a group of them to, to recreate this, this, uh, uh, this craft and to return it. So thank you very much. Thank you for all the people, far too many to be able to mention, blah, blah, blah. You know, many, many people have helped. And I'm truly grateful, Yanni. It's, it's, it's been so far amazing. And, uh, uh, you know, Bab Sama Muftur, who, who, khair, alhamdulillah. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> Rasha, thank you very much indeed. I mean, convinced me boats are beautiful. They are. Really. <laughs> yes. um, I think we have a few minutes for some questions. I want to leave uh, sufficient time for you, of course, to explore the models and also uh, join us at the reception. But uh, a few, few questions. I'm sure there must be many. Yes. Please. Are you aware that the Phoenicians circumnavigated Africa in 600 BC? No, I'm not. That's just fascinating. Are you free tomorrow? Uh, I, I maybe. Egyptian cultural bureau. Yes. Because Philip Neal is going to give a give, give a presentation like this. Yeah. He recreated one on an island off the shore of Syria before things went to Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. 2009, 10 was the expedition, and a Brazilian friend of mine was on the crew for the whole circumnavigation. Amazing. Yeah. And I said, "What about Somali pirates?" He said, "Yes, darling. We're three thousand pirates in the ocean." I'd and definitely go. And the president wants him to build three there as well because they want 
I think I think retraining boats is a thing to do now. Definitely, definitely. Inshallah, I I I I will see you later maybe and, and get some details. I'd love to go and visit that. Shukran for the wonderful presentation. I'm just absorbing it all. And my question is actually um, almost a personal question because you talked about how the cradle of civilization is becoming the coffin of civilization. And that to me, as someone who's worked in Iraq for over two decades, just hit me in the heart. And I know you are so passionate about this project and you have these young people now that are representing the hope for the future. But how do you reconcile those moments of despair with the importance of the work that you're doing and your hope for the future? I mean, there's always hope. And the, the, the fact that I, I haven't said that it has become a coffin, but it's on the way to becoming one. You know? I mean, the loss of the water, the loss of land, the loss of the connection, those are, those are systemic problems over here that, that need to be addressed. You know, in, in whatever small way that this project can maybe sort of at least reconnect, you know, I think is, is well worth the effort. You know? And you know, I, I, frankly, as an artist, I cannot anymore uh, condone my making art if that source is, is threatened in this way. So I do see this as all the things that Ahmed said it's not. Yeah? And as well what he described it because he described it very beautifully you know, as a rescue mission. But it's also a study. You know? It's also an artwork. It's also all of these things. You know? It's not just an artwork, not just a system. It's all of these things. I consider it an artwork. So as something that I can do, I'm doing it, and I'm, I'm really happy that people have seen it fit to support to get it going. I think it can do a lot. I think it can do a lot, but there's a lot of people working as well in Iraq. There are more and more people working. So there is still hope, but uh, 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 the situation is dire. It's, it is dire, but it can always return, inshallah. You know, it can be fixed, inshallah. The marshes have returned and gone and come back. And you know, Iraq has, has you know, witnessed, what, 23 invasions and occupations, etc. in its history. It has been wiped out by the Mongols. It's been what, but this is the first time that these crafts have disappeared. I mean, we look at archaeology, and we're discovering a lot of things from archaeology. You know, but archaeology, that's, the, you know, that's the, you know, the temple, the palaces, etc. That which fed it, that developed it, that made it, has been a constant. It's been in the, in the environment always. The craftsmen, the makers, environment. For the first time, that's now an archaeological strata. For the first time now, we have an archaeological strata that is the archives of the 20th century of what Iraq was. I mean, we're that far gone. But I still have hope. Otherwise, Yanni, you know. You see? I just one more question. It's not a question. It's just a comment. You may well know this, but on Lake Tana in Ethiopia... The locals use these sort of reed boats as well. Your little model reminded me very much of, of, of the, the boats, the vernacular boats that they use on Lake Tana. In indeed, Ethiopia. indeed. And, and they, they are, wherever you have reeds, they make these boats. They were made in Europe as well. You know, yeah. They were made in North America, South America, everywhere. I mean, this is part of what I, what I call this sort of universal language mm. of making. You know, it's, 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 a, it's an alphabet of making that... People had all over. Nobody invented something first. It's, it's circumstances that push people to do with what they know how to fix a situation. And we have to discover ways of fixing the situation we're in, which is globally a problem. Inshallah khairani. Thank you very much indeed. Um, may I now invite Sir Terence Clark to give a photo of Oh, that's nice. In the, his introduction this evening, Paul Collins said that we were, could expect a real treat uh, this evening, and I think uh, that was a huge understatement. We enjoyed this evening a cornucopia of riches, uh, starting with the wonderful introduction of 
the panoply of Iraqi art. Um, I can recall myself when the new Museum of Modern Art was opened uh, just near my embassy in Baghdad. The wonderful collection that was on display there, I have no idea what has happened to it now, but uh, there were examples from the Rawad uh, school, the pioneers in uh, modern art in Iraq. Um, and that tradition, I hope, has survived. Uh, to what degree, I don't know. And then, of course, uh, Rashad Salim has overwhelmed us with his enthusiasm uh, for his subject. Uh, I don't know how young or old you were when you first came to it, but you've clearly grown into it over the, the, uh, the years mm -hmm. and have managed this evening to convey uh, some of that, uh, a lot of that enthusiasm uh, to this audience. I just feel a little despair in my soul because Iraq today is beset with so many uh, problems at every level uh, from, and people are much more concerned about whether they will have electricity tomorrow or water the day after than with the way people used to build boats. Uh, but I, you said that you had hope and I too have hope that people like you will inspire uh, particularly the younger generation to work towards uh, preserving for future generations some of these wonderful artifacts, these wonderful creations uh, of Iraq. So I ask you all to join your hands together in thanks to our speaker. Normally when I do talks, I, I put this boat like in the sea of hands. I forgot to do that. But it can, it can travel around, and I'm sure it will return. This actually went with me on the Tigris. You know? <laughs> so you can just pass it around, and these are other boats. And this is an example of Art Izar. So it's, it's one, one old lady who used to make Izar. These things, and she decided that she doesn't want to make the traditional one. She wants to make her dreams. So um, um, supporting, and they're absolutely gorgeous. She's an artist, a naive artist, that we've discovered. One of the very few in Iraq. Yeah. Ah, that's a goof boy. Yeah. It is, it's, it's solid uh, alpha. alpha.